to Nationwide on NTA. My name is Sogochkuka Ona. You're welcome. President Bola Tinubu has assured Nigerians of his commitment to peace while demanding that those who perpetrated the recent killing of officers and soldiers on peacekeeping mission in Delta State will be made to face the law. Delta State Governor Sharif Oborewori revealed this after briefing the president over the incident. Feeding questions from State House correspondents after the meeting behind closed doors, Governor Oborewori said the March 14th killing of the military was in contrast with the peace accord earlier signed by the conflicting parties. And because Delta State is governed within the tenet of rules of law and decency. So what happened is not in line with what we are doing in Delta State because I have promised Deltans that uh, I'm going to be governor for all Deltans and um, we have been enjoying peace. What is happening now is something that we did not bargain for. But we want to assure everybody that there will be no more attack on the villages if there's anyone that, will, that has happened in the past. We've all agreed, all the security agencies I put the heads together, we are on the same page to fish out the real culprit. Because innocent people will not suffer out of will not suffer from it. And they have assured that no innocent person will be will be victimized. And now Senate has condemned the horrific murder of 17 officers and soldiers in Okwama community. Delta State last Thursday while on a peace mission. The lawmakers also stressed that those responsible for the killing must be identified and apprehended to face justice in a fair and transparent legal process. The resolutions are sequel to a matter of urgent public importance raised by Senator Abdulaziz Yaradua. Senate calls for immediate compensation to families of the slain soldiers as investigations unravel the circumstances surrounding the tragic incident continue. Recognizing their impact on national security and peace and emphasizing the need for meticulous engagement with civilian communities and regions to foster mutual understanding. It's not every day, even in a war situation, it's not every day a country suffers this kind of loss. The military is doing their best. They are doing their best, trying to deal with kidnappers, trying to deal with uh, bandits and so on and so forth, trying to make us safe, keep us safe. Now some people decided to go and murder these people. So I think it's something that we should all condemn. And we should Every single culprit in, involved must be brought out to face the full wrath of the law. So in the course of it, there may be collateral damage. But maybe through our inquiries, if we mix with the communities and try to find out what actually went wrong, we may even assist both parties to reach a amicable resolution. But nobody, no country, will accept the kind of thing that we have just witnessed. And similarly, the House of Representatives has condemned in strong terms the killing of 17 soldiers who were ambushed last week while on peace mission in Okwama community in Uheli South, local government area of Delta State. Adopting a motion of urgent import national importance by Representative Baba Jimmy Benson, the House urged the military to carry out thorough investigation and unmask the perpetrators of the gruesome murder of the soldiers to face the law. The very people the Nigerian armed forces are meant to protect have the potential of demoralizing the military and affecting the war on insecurity and insurgency, which has so far recorded some huge successes. And I appeal to our military in the face of this huge provocation to please uh, uh, observe some uh, international protocol and human and stop the uh, current burning going on in the community so that investigations can go on and the real culprits are apprehended and brought before uh, justice. Meanwhile, the FCT administration has defended its 2024 budget proposal of 1.14 trillion naira before the House Committee on FCT. The committee called for more accountability from the chairman of the FCT area councils, especially concerning infrastructure, 
in the suburbs of the nation's capital. No roads. You are giving them monies, nothing to show. They come into uh, the main city, they collect uh, revenues, we give them 10%, nothing to show. And in our budget again, we are still giving them uh, projects. Projects over 100 billion now is going to cost or 200. So uh, they need to sit up. In 2023 to now, as we come on board, with our interaction with the area council's stakeholders, we are able to start construction of six roads as identified by the various stakeholders in the various area councils. And those six roads will be completed by the grace of God, August, September. And we also provided for 2024 another six roads for the area councils as identified by the stakeholders of the various area councils. In the meantime, Senate has received the 2024 budget estimates of 1.1 trillion naira for the Federal Capital Territory. The FCT Minister, Yeson Wike, presented the proposed estimates to the Senate Committee for scrutiny. National Assembly correspondent Joshua Ogunjide has details. With an increase of 41 billion naira above that of year 2023, making it a total sum of 141 billion naira for the 2024 fiscal year, representing 12.28% increase for personnel costs in the year 2024 as against some of 99.5 billion naira in 2023. The budget as presented as 726.3 billion naira representing 63.28% for capital expenditure while recurrent expenditure takes the sum of 721.4 billion naira representing 36.72%. Distinguished colleagues, as you are aware, this meeting is scheduled to deliberate on the provisions of the FCT 2024 budget proposals with the Honorable Minister and the Minister of State and all other relevant officials of the FCT. Distinguished Senators, ladies and gentlemen, may I remind you that this meeting is a constitutional requirement in line with powers conferred on the National Assembly towards the passage of bill into law. Therefore, the committee solicits for the FCT administration's utmost cooperation and support in our deliberations. Paragraph 6 has to do with the expenditure performance of the 2023 statutory appropriation. Of the total actual receipt of the sum of 403, the sum of 242 billion has been expended which were shown in the table below. You can see personal cost, overhead costs, capital expenditure, and then gives you the appropriation total, which is 641, actual expenditure, which gives you 244, 242, and then the percentage. Uh, it will be in that what would you have, 38% percentage of the appropriation of 2023. The increase, the minister says, is to accommodate the emolument of appointed mandate secretaries and other political appointees of the administration and payment of staff promotion arrears. From the National Assembly, Joshua Aguchiri, NT News. Minority Leader of the House of Representatives, Kinsley Chinda, says the parliamentary system of government being proposed should be test run at the level of the local government before it is escalated to the state and national levels over a four-year interval. This was while discussing proposals to introduce the parliamentary system of government on Good Morning Nigeria, which has become a subject of wide debates in Nigeria. Ekemini Williams has details. 60 members of the House of Representatives, led by the minority leader, Kingsley Chinda, presented a bill at amending relevant provisions of the 1999 Constitution to enable the country to transit from the presidential to the parliamentary system of government. They believe that the parliamentary system will be more cost-effective and accountable to the people. Discussing their proposal on the program, Mr. Chinda and one of their guests, Festus Uguche, a constitutional lawyer, reiterated some of the challenges with the presidential system of government and how the preferred parliamentary government should be introduced. Gradually, we are not saying that, look, you wake up tomorrow morning and you dovetail into a, 
a parliamentary system of government? No. Because we know that there will be problems. Start from the local government level. Practice it and begin to see the problems and the faults. Correct it and then you move to the state level. We've been seeing a lot of impunity in, 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 more, in more recent times, such that it's incomparable with the one of 1960 and 1963 constitution. The parliamentary system has its very serious, inherent, inbuilt mechanism to ensure that nobody exceeds his allocated power. Other speakers on the program called for a sovereign national conference where issues of national concern can be debated publicly and a restoration of transparent local government elections. As we speak today, Honorable Buchinda should be aware that there is no local government election going on throughout the country. So the first thing that you need to do is to even start practicing local government elections. If you dissolve this national assembly, and then you have a constituent assembly of the Nigerian people where we can debate these issues and then come back with a form of government. The problem has always been with the implementation. The issue is not with the system. It is with the implementation of the system. The guest, however, noted that Nigerians will have the final say on the system of governance. In Abuja, Ekemeni Williams, NTNU. And now to judicial matters. The Federal High Court Abuja Division has refused to admit the leader of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu Bail, in the terrorism charge against him. The presiding judge, Justice Bin Tanyako, declined the grant to grant Kanu Bail on the ground that the earlier application he filed had been refused. Justice Nyako held that the only option open to Kanu was to have gone to court of appeal to challenge the earlier refusal. The court also refused to give unfettered access to just anybody to visit Kanu in DSS custody for security reasons. Kanu had on February 26 applied for a fresh bail and predicated his request mainly on the ground that he may not be able to put up a good defense in the charge against him unless admitted to bail to have unfettered access to his counsel. Khan also claimed to be suffering from acute hypertension and acute heart disease, among others. The federal government, however, objected to the request on the ground that Kano was once granted bail, but jumped and fled the country. Justice Nyako asked the defendant to proceed to court of appeal to ventilate his anger against the earlier decision of the courts, rather than coming back with same request. Adiola is in Lagos with more reports this afternoon. Adiola. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Agachikuka. For Nigeria to make meaningful and compact progress in political, economic and social affairs, there is need for a people-oriented constitution with coordinated inputs from all sections of the country. This sums up deliberations at a national constitutional dialogue organized by the Patriots, a group of eminent Nigerians in honor a foremost constitutional lawyer, late Professor Bain Wabwezi. The lingering political challenges, economic lockjam, demographic and geographical issues that Nigeria as a nation has been battling with were on the front burner as eminent Nigerians under the auspices of the Patriots converged on Lagos to prefer solutions. Speakers at the colloquium highlighted the process of making Nigeria great again through a constitution that will guarantee equitable distribution of the nation's wealth, human rights expressions, true and fiscal federalism. Either we accept the 2014 National Conference as acceptable platform or relatively inexpensive directly elected constituent assembly. We need to decentralize, give the states more authority, and have our zones, all states, as a federation unit. There were inspiring discussions from elder statesmen on restructuring the nation constitutionally. It's not the National Assembly that will make those amendments. And it, it makes a lot of logical sense. It is for the National Assembly to set up, to constitute a law, a simple law, where the people will come together and make those amendments for themselves. We'll provide our offices 
to collaborate with these uh, the patriots and all well-meaning Nigerians to move and promote that bill that will now establish the referendum commission for us to have and make a pathway. Whatever this national referendum commission, NRC, collects together to a referendum of the Nigerian people. Recommendations from this colloquium is expected to be presented to the presidency and the National Assembly for further deliberation and adoption. To prune down the alarming figure of kidney disease in Nigeria, early detection and lifestyle modification are pivotal to prevent the health challenge from escalating into an epidemic. Joel Pokwola reports that medical experts are urging government and relevant stakeholders to step up intervention just like it did during the COVID-19 pandemic to curtail the increase in kidney-related diseases. More than 850 million people worldwide have some form of kidney disease or the other. Nigeria is not left out of these scary statistics. One of the most crucial ways to achieve a decline in kidney disease is through awareness by government agencies and non-governmental organizations to forestall what experts unanimously agreed could be an epidemic if not nipped in the board. Gathered here are medical experts and other like minds who have treated over a thousand cases of kidney disease through dialysis. Although transplant they say could be an option for chronic kidney failure, but they believe nothing is as good as prevention. The only way you can prevent is if you detect that you have it. So everyone should use the opportunity to visit a screening center or if you go to hospital, get someone to check your blood pressure, get someone to check your blood sugar, get someone to check your urine and make sure there's no protein in the urine. Once your kidneys fail, the chances of, I mean, it's, it's, it's literally a death sentence unless you can afford dialysis and dialysis is expensive and you can't continue dialysis indefinitely you will need a kidney transplant so these are some of the things that really mean that people have to pay attention to it non-governmental organizations are championing the awareness hoping nigerians will prioritize care for the kidney every year we have of this and what we want to do now is increase it so that it's not a yearly thing again it could be monthly, it could be quarterly. We go to institutions, places of worship to create awareness. Periodic medical checkup is also jamming for early detection of kidney disease. In Lagos, Joel Bukwola, NT News. And those are the stories. Welcome to Enugu. Anambra State Government is introducing a digital education sector with the distribution of over 2,000 laptops to all head teachers and principals of public and public mission schools in the state. Ndem Kalu reports. The distribution of the laptops is in line with the governor's promise to furnish schools with work tools and facilitate access to Wi Fi. It seeks to position public schools in the state as exemplars of educational excellence, highlighting the critical role and contributions of teachers in molding the future of pupils and students in the state. The governor stated that Anambra is doing well within the country, reiterating the need for schools in the state to strive to be compared with the countries of the world where education is at its peak. He emphasized the need for qualitative teaching and learning, promising to continue to ensure teachers are well equipped to make them competitive at home and exportable abroad. Smart education begins with what? Smart teachers. And when you get out to the smart teachers, it all begins with the leadership. As we avail our teachers in Anambra, where they represent work tools that they require as we begin to march towards smart education. Commissioner for Education, Professor Ngozi Chuma Ude, applauded the giant strides the governor has achieved in the sector, especially the tuition-free education in the state. We of the educational family 
are ever so grateful to you. Because we are the most favored in your administration. The beneficiaries are expected to safeguard the work tools and put them to use in order to achieve efficient service delivery in Oka, Ndemkalo, and Tia News. The need for massive investment in agriculture for food sustainability was the trust of a meeting between the officials of the International Fund for Agricultural Development, IFAD, and the Enugu State Government. Chika Ugu reports. Strategic meeting between the state government and IFAD is one of several initiatives to explore the agricultural potential of Enugu State with a view to promoting investment in the sector. The Deputy Governor Ifani Osai disclosed that government has continued to support farmers and other stakeholders in the entire agricultural value chain to create investment opportunities as well as sustainable growth and tackle the perennial food shortage not just in Enugu but also the country. If we must migrate our people from poverty to economic stability. Agriculture is the lowest ranking food. And in a continent, uh, in a country that's battling the high cost of food and the shortage of food, this is the best time to deal with improving agriculture. The Associate Vice President, Program Management Department Donald Brown said the agency was in Enugu to inspect existing agricultural projects while exploring new areas of investment. I'm very happy with your emphasis on sustainability. For us, we should not be supporting projects if they're not sustainable. When we go, the project should remain, should scale up, and that is really success for us, is when the project finishes, that the work continues. So Representatives of the international agency and officials of the Enugu state government express optimism that the collaboration will create employment and self-sufficiency in food production. In Enugu, Chika Ugu, NTA News. And those are the stories from Enugu. We'll now return you back to Ogotukuka in Abuja for the continuation of Nationwide. Wow. Thank you, Chineye. Now, it's been more than a week since President Bola Ahmed Tinubu lifted sanctions and opened borders to the Niger Republic. Shortly after, the Nigerian Customs Service and other security agencies at the border declared official transactions of legal international trade. Usman Abdullahi takes a look at the impact of the border opening on communities around the border. It's closed for about a period of eight months which affected the social economic activities of communities in the two countries. Ali Uzaki Kamba and Muhammad Kabir live and do business in Kamba. Many business stopped operating because of the border closure. Many traders were bankrupt. Most of us ate our capital when the border was closed. You can imagine having a family and no job to feed them. Now the border has been reopened for international trade and social interactions has also resumed to the fullest. We are happy now. Our social activities will be on. We can see our relatives over there and they can also visit us. The officials of the Nigerian Customs Service, however, warn against exportation of food grains considering the hike in the prices of food items in the country. The Kambo community are grateful for the reopening, saying it is a new ray of hope for social economic activities in the area. From Kamba, Usman Abdullah Shehu, NTA News. Thank you very much, Usman. And now, Yabode Olonshola is at Kamba border to tell us more on what is happening at the border. Yabode, very good afternoon to you. So what more can you tell us uh, is the situation there at this time? Yes, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in Kebi State. I am standing a few meters away from Niger Republic. I would have loved to take you a few steps behind me uh, to show you what is really happening at uh, the border. But if I did that, I would be trespassing. What the Niger Republic border has done is to fell big trees to block its own entrance. So while our border from the Nigeria end is opened 
to international trade, that of Nigerian Republic is closed. And that is why you see the kind of uh, non-vehicular movement at this uh, time of the day. Otherwise, this place is usually hustling and bustling with trucks, exporting grains out of this country. But now that the Nigerian Customs has even prohibited exportation of grains, this situation is more going to likely remain for quite a while. You know, it will be um, not be business as usual. The large chunk of vehicular movement here is those who are exporting grains out of uh, the country and of course you know the implication it will have on uh, the Nigerian economy and gradually depleting our food uh, grains uh, reserve. So with that now there will be more activities on the legal trade. The customs, the Nigerian customs has emphasized that it should be legal trade and nothing else but legal trade. Yeah, but they, I, I, I didn't get that quite clearly. You said the border you know, from the Nigerian end is open and that from the Niger end is still closed. So did you get any information on why it is so? Well, I, there's no way I can cross into Niger border. If I try to cross into Niger border, I'll be committing a crime because I don't have a pass to cross into the Niger border to ask them. But the much I can give you is that they have blocked their border with trees. I tried to move closer, but we couldn't move closer. Otherwise, I would have loved to take you down to see the trees that and the gates that they have used to block the road. You can see some uh, motorbikes moving behind me. The motorbikes are coming from Niger Republic. They, I wonder why they are granted permission to come in from the Niger end, but not the Niger, of course, Nigerian end is open so they can pass through. But from the Niger end, they are also allowing passage to motorcycles are not the trucks. So you can't see any trucks or any vehicular movement here because of the blockage from the Niger Republic end. Uh, thank you very much for that information and for the updates. Okay, and now back here, the Independent Media Policy Initiative has said that there are very favorable data to show that Nigeria has a robust investment climate under the President Bola Tinubu administration, contrary to the narrative of an economy shown of investor confidence. Zenre Dimu has details. Independent Media and Policy Initiative noted that it came to the conclusion after a comparative analysis between Nigeria and some other countries, including India and the UK. According to the policy think tank, at the time the Manufacturers Association of Nigeria was announcing the shutdown of 767 companies in 2023, the Small Business Advocacy Group in the United Kingdom was reporting 345,000 business closures in the UK. Also, 460,000 companies shut down every quarter in China and 10,655 micro, small and medium enterprises shut down in 2022 and 2023 in India, which is not comparable to Nigeria's case. IMPI also wondered why those criticizing the exit of giant drug companies GSK PLC and Sanofi are silent over the approval by the National Agency for Food and Drug Administration and control of 105 applications for the construction of drug manufacturing facilities. It added that while profits at China's industrial firms fell 2.3% in 2023, data from Nigeria's National Bureau of Statistics shows that Company income tax rose by 73% year-on-year from 2.82 trillion naira in the 2022 financial year to 4.89 trillion naira in the 2023 financial year. The huge profit difference which was recorded despite headwinds, IMPI says is a clear indication that the country avails investors the best possible opportunities for return on investments. Zen Redding Moon, NTA News.
In our health matters, there is a promising hope for premature infants and their families in Ocean State as the innovative kangaroo mother care program by World Health Organization begins in the state. The center for the program is situated inside Ocean State Specialist Hospital, Oshobo. Let's now join Femi Afarugun for details. With a mission to redefine neonatal care, World Health Organization chose Osho State as a pilot state in Nigeria for its kangaroo mother care program, providing facilities and equipment at the state hospital at Shubiaro Oshobo for the smooth takeoff of the program. Kangaroo mother care emphasizes the power of skin to skin contact between mothers and premature or low birth weight infants. Kangaroo Mother Care has finally taken off at the State Hospital at Shubiaro and delegates from WHO are meticulously assessing the implementation of the KFC program. Kangaroo Mother Care is not a new innovation. It, it has always been there for the past two decades. But the problem has been that the intervention coverage has been very low and the uptake of KMC has been very low. But what we can see is with the commitment of the government and all of the staff here, the dedicated staff here, there's really been an effort to get this going. KMC has proven to be a game changer in providing health outcomes for newborn babies worldwide. You know, it's good to transfer mothers who are likely to have small babies to the center where they'll be cared for. And everything is here. You have a neonatologist who will also be taking care of the babies. This baby needs special care. So with the KMC program, we can actually use little resources to achieve maximum benefit. Osho State government promised to maximize the program to help save the state from infant mortality. In Oshogbo Femi, Afari Ogun, NTA News. Joining me live now from Oshogbo is also Femi Afari Ogun to tell us more on this kangaroo mother care program. Uh, uh, Femi, it's over to you. Thank you. World Health Organization put it that 31% of newborn deaths in Nigeria are directly due to complications of preterm birth, that which when combined with effect of low birth rate is an indirect cause of up to 80% of newborn death in Nigeria. Uh, with this kangaroo mother care, it has been proven that it is a wonderful intervention for the care of preterm and low birth weight babies, especially where there is limited availability of incubators needed to provide warmth for the new babies. Uh, kangaroo mother care helps infants receive higher mother milk during hospitalization. It increases the chance of exclusive breastfeeding and the chance of body features such as body weight and, and length. Uh, Ugo Chukuka, uh, let me tell you this. Osho State is privileged to have uh, a 120 bedded space for this program designed by the World Health Organization at the State Specialist Hospital here at Ashubiaro in Oshobo. Uh, this is a pilot program here in Osho State and had provided the necessary, the World Health Organization had provided the necessary equipment and training for smooth operation of the program. Inside there are doctors and nurses trained in kangaroo mother care and through this program, this place has become fully operational. Uh, thank you very much. He says emphasizing the power of skin to skin mother care between uh, the mother and the child. Now, can you explain the process of implementing the kangaroo mother care program and how is the compliance level in the community? Osho State uh, Specialist Hospital, Ashubi Aroye, is a sec secondary health care, so it serves as a referral point for pregnant or nursing mother who need uh, kangaroo mother care from different primary health centers across, across the state. Prior to the starting of this uh, kangaroo mother care program, the mother will be informed about the program, its benefits. So it now depends on the mother to determine whether he or she wants to do the kangaroo mother care program.
Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Femi. I think I have an idea of what you're talking about. Thank you very much for your contribution. Now, in Aquaibon State, work is ongoing at the construction site of a power substation undertaken by the Minister of Power and the Transmission Company of Nigeria at Ididep. Ibiono Ibom local government area. Etienne Ibanga reports that the project started at the last administration in February last year and is expected to meet the power needs of neighboring states when completed. Visit to this power substation project indicates that two power transformers and accessories are already on the ground. And from the fund provided, we are able to be able to procure the offshore equipment. The offshore equipment ranging from the transformer 2 number 30 by 40 MV8 power transformer 132-3. The project sits on 9 hectares of land with a perimeter fencing at the site at about 80% completion with height and cutting dish of about 6 meters from the natural ground when completed. We have completed the transformer plant. The earthwork has been done, cutting and filling. It's a federal government funded project and uh, it's well conceived. The idea is okay because the community here, they will be the beneficiary and the industry will now spring off. This substation, which is put at about 6 billion naira, when completed will address the power needs of Ibionibom in a parts of Odupani in Cross River State as well as Harochuku in Abia State. Etienne Ibanga, NTN News. Meduguri has the next set of reports and Ladidi is there. Ladidi, you are on. Thank you. Welcome to Meduguri. Good to have you join us. But no state government has called on Muslims' clerics to be moderate in their messages during Ramadan tafsir Quranic translation to avoid extremist and negative preaching. State Commissioner for Information and Internal Security Professor Osman Tar stated this during a press briefing at the end of the periodic Security Council meeting held at the government house my degree. Mohamed Guni reports. The meeting had in attendance Governor Bagana Umar Azilim, the Deputy Governor Umar Usman Kadapur, Shaho Borno, Abakari Bun Umar Gerbe El Kanemi, Secretary to the State Government Bukar Tijani, relevant commissioners and heads of security agencies in the state. Briefing journalists shortly after the security meeting, Commissioner for Information and Internal Security, Professor Usman Tar said the council after deliberations called on Islamic clerics to be moderate in their messages during the Ramadan to avoid extremism. Council considered the security situation in Borno State and expressed concern with the breach of security in some of our IDP camps. The Security Council commended the military and other relevant security agencies for the tireless effort at curbing criminality in the state, assuring of state government's readiness to support all security agencies. The meeting called on the Borno state government to ensure the enforcement of ban on illegal mining in the state, even as he announced state government's plan to establish mining company to ensure regulation of mining activities. The Security Council meeting also enjoined the security agencies to allow access and passage of transborder trade with the neighboring countries as well as countries of Central Africa to promote transborder trade. The Council also commended the efforts of the Borno State Government in providing humanitarian support to the citizens, especially the IDPs and vulnerables in the wake of economic hardship and in the month of Ramadan. In Maiduguri, Mahmoud Goni, NTN News. How a Muslim should make the best use of Ramadan fast was the focus of four papers presented to mark the 19th edition of Borno Radio and Television Annual Ramadan Lecture in Medjugorje. Memuna Gerber reports. For 19 good years, Islamic scholars and two other Muslim bodies converged on the premises of the Borno State Government-owned media outfit to deliberate on topical issues affecting the Muslim community. This year's Ramadan-themed Ramadan and economic reality are no different as four topics were carefully chosen by the organizers in tune with the realities of the time. Guest lecturers Sheikh Abubakar Kiari, Sheikh Modu Mustafa and Professor Yohuza dwelt extensively on the need for adherence to the teachings of Islam, one of the virtues of the Ramadan fast. They also reminded the faithful to desist from rebelling against constituted authority as that has no place in Islam. 
Borno State Governor Professor Babagana Umara Zulum was represented by the Commissioner of Information and Internal Security, Professor Usman Char. Ulamas spoke on the importance of uh, being merciful to the poor and also being obedient to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, for leaders to be responsible and also for followers to be prayerful. Our leaders, our traditional rulers for all to take their responsibility to heart and also to be uh, merciful to the people. General Manager of Bono Radio Television Corporation, Omar Mohammed, spoke on what informed the annual convention every Ramadan. At this time around we decided to bring in the religious leaders so that it is the holy month of Ramadan. People should be informed on the good deeds, I mean the goods of uh, Ramadan. Goodwill messages by prominent guests centered on need to lend support to the needy, need for personal and societal reorientation for the current myriad of challenges to ease. In Maiduguri, Maimuna Garba, NTA News. That does it. The Corps Marshal Federal Safety Corps, Dawuda Alibiu, has mandated sector commanders nationwide to strengthen enforcement and advocacy campaigns on cautioning trailers against conveying human beings on top of goods. A statement by the Assistant Corps Marshal Jonas Ago notes that the Corps Marshal is reacting to the avoidable road traffic crash that occurred on the Abuja Kaduna Expressway on 18th March 2024 involving a DAF trailer as a result of excessive speed overloading and fatigue. Near 10 persons died and others injured. The Corps Marshal also directed commanding officers to commence with immediate effect oriented patrol operations and organize adequate mobile court operations along critical corridors. He directed the FRSC operatives to follow up on the injured victims in the hospitals to ensure they receive necessary medical attention. Now, gender and disability focal persons in ministries, departments and agencies have been exposed to adoptable models to be utilized to guarantee inclusion and safety. This is to end all forms of discrimination against women and children with disabilities and protect their fundamental human rights. Elizabeth Omori reports that the training is at the instance of the National Commission for Persons with Disabilities. Over 1 billion people experience some form of disability and the United Nations says global prevalence is greater for women at 19%. This underscores the importance of this interactive session for focal persons in MDAs to be acquainted with social and human rights models to advance issues of disabilities. The focal persons will be, you know, will be updated and will be trained and will be encouraged to inclusion. These models seek to address issues of accessibility, health care, stereotyping, unemployment, as well as protection of rights. Most of the time it is also very good to use these models as a way of aligning with what the art has said and begin to adopt it in our work. They say disability is everybody's responsibility and government agencies should prioritize the interest of women with disabilities. Elizabeth Omori, NTA News. Next is Sports Update with Gift George as guide. Between, Between Nigeria and Ghana in football will once again be rekindled at the finals of the women's football event at the ongoing 13th Africa Games in Ghana. In the first semi final played on Monday night, the defending champions Nigeria's Falconets beat their Ugandan counterpart by two goals to nil, all scored in the second half of the match. While host Ghana's Black Princesses defeated their Senegalese opponents by three goals to one to set up an interesting final against Nigeria on Thursday. Every participant in this tournament came for the gold. They have one goal, which is the gold. And then we are working towards it. We are not allowing any distraction to take away that focus from us. So we are, I'm, to, I'm calling out to Nigeria to please pray for us and also keep supporting us for us to get the gold. We're going out there as defending champions to make sure that we're not letting whatever we we'll hold on to go. That we're building a team for the World Cup and believing that we want the mentality that when we get to the World Cup, we are champions in Africa. In other news, Minister of Sports Development John Enno says for the country to excel and maintain its relevance in international competitions, it needs to remodel its pattern of sports programs. 
the minister who was in Ghana to watch and motivate Nigerian athletes at the 13th Africa Games in Ghana maintained that much needs to be done and found them the right process of sports development to produce world champions for the country. There's nothing like adequate preparations and training and I mean we need to deviate you know a lot more from funding competitions as they come to also funding the development of the sports and the games to get us well prepared for the competitions. Meanwhile in volleyball the Nigerian Volleyball Federation says it hopes to qualify for the forthcoming Olympic Games which will take place in France later in the year. For the Federation the Africa Games ongoing in Ghana will be used to assess the team's abilities to qualify for the Olympic Games in France. African Games is a developmental uh, level stage. The all are all is the Paris 2024. Their performance here will determine going for the uh, uh, continental. With sports update, Gift George, NCA News. And as the news, thank you for finding time to join us. Do have a very wonderful evening. Thank <laughs> you.